It is good to be here to worship with you all this morning. Um, I want to go over in Sabbath school, uh, Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. I'm going to introduce the topic, and then we're going to pray. Now, the reason why we're going over this, the Lord has impressed me in these last days that there's nothing his people need as much as his character. This is the final work before Jesus Christ can come. And in many of Jesus' final parables and um, final talks with his disciples, the thing he emphasized most was the character of God being shown through his people. And so that's what we're going to go over today. It's a very important topic, and we're going to also follow up with a sermon on a very similar topic as well. So we're going to talk about character development, what it takes to have a character like Jesus Christ. So let us pray before we start. Oh, dear Father God, Lord, we thank you that we can be gathered here on your Sabbath this morning. We thank you that you promised the Holy Spirit to be here among us. Lord, your blessings pour down like rain, the early and the latter rain, Lord. We know it's about time for the latter rain to come. We desire your Spirit inside of us. We need more insight from your Bible. We need to understand the words of Jesus Christ as he was speaking for these last days. Please bless our minds, give us wisdom and guidance and direction. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. By the way, you guys have a beautiful little church. Um, First time I saw it was going to the Hartford Fair about five or so years ago and came in, saw the books. I was an Adventist already, but didn't realize there was an Adventist church right here. Um, That's the first time I believe my grandma saw it as well. Um, And this, by the way, is just amazing. That's awesome. I haven't seen one of those before. Uh, but let's get into it. Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 13. We're going to start just going verse by verse. I want it to be interactive, so if you have a question, please raise your hand. If you have a thought or comment, please raise your hand. Um, that's what Sabbath school is supposed to be like. It's study time, right? Yeah. Let's study. Okay, so verse 1. Yes, you guys can all hear me, right? Verse 1, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. Okay, first of all, just starting, who is the bridegroom they're going out to meet? Jesus Christ is the bridegroom that meets his bride. Um, He's the one we're waiting for, or should I say waiting for us. Uh, Who are the ten virgins, and what does a virgin represent in the Bible? Any idea what a virgin represents? Okay, people in the church. Um, What kind of? Pure. Yeah, that's exactly right. Go Hold the spot and go to Revelation chapter 14, verse 6. I'm sorry, verse 4. Revelation chapter 14, verse 4. If someone has that, they can read it nice and loud for us. Okay. So your ver- the version said pure. Some versions say they are what? Virgins, that's exactly right. So notice, these ten virgins are pure. They are not defiled. Now this is symbolic, of course, not talking about actual virginity, but virginity as far as with God in a pure relationship. So notice that all ten of these women are virgins in Matthew 25. They profess a pure faith. They have true doctrines. These are not hypocrites. None of them are. In Matthew 25. 
Okay. All ten virgins have something in their hands. What do they have in their hands? A lamp. Now, what does a lamp represent in the Bible? No? What did you say? The Word of God. Who has a Bible verse for us? Anyone have one that comes to the top of their head? Psalms 119, verse 105. Could somebody turn there and read that for us? Exactly right. Yes, sir. Okay. Everyone heard that. The Bible says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So all ten virgins have what? Yeah, they all have the word. They all have the truth in the word. They have their Bibles. They understand their Bibles very well. But yet five of them are wise and five are foolish. We're going to see that. Okay. They all went forth to meet the bridegroom. Now I want to pause right there. Matthew chapter 25 comes directly after Matthew chapter what? 24. And in Matthew chapter 24, what do we find? Anyone? No? The second coming. Jesus, the signs of the second coming, that's exactly right. On the mountain of Mount Olivet, Jesus is sitting with his disciples, and he is very sorrowful because they have rejected him as the Messiah. And some of his disciples come to him and say, listen, look at the temple, how beautiful it is. And he tells them, what? It's going to be destroyed. Not one stone will be left. And they say, wow, this must be the what? The second coming or the end of the world. So after he gives them this illustration on Mount Olivet, in the daytime, as the lights are shining off the temple and looking beautiful and magnificent, directly after that, he gives them the parable of the ten virgins. So I want you to imagine for a second as Jesus and his disciples are sitting on the mountain and evening has come, the sun has gone down, maybe you know, the, the night sky might be red and pink and purple with all its beautiful colors, and Jesus in the distance with his disciples, they see a group of young women waiting. Now, in the east, there was tradition that the bride would wait with her bridesmaids, and the bridegroom, the groomsmen, would come and get the bride and bring her back to his home, and they would have a party together. Isn't that beautiful? Well, that's what these young women were waiting for. They were waiting for the bridegroom. So they were waiting. He saw, him and his disciples saw this beautiful illustration. Jesus now paints this picture of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Verse 2. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. Well, what makes them wise or foolish? Verse 3. They that were foolish took their lamps, but what? No took no oil. Now, wouldn't that be silly to take a lamp and have no oil? Do you think they had oil to begin with? Well, I'm sure they had oil to begin with, but what? They didn't have enough oil. They didn't take extra oil with them. So when the time came, they were sitting there just holding a what? A lamp. Now, a dark lamp. Because what's a lamp for? Light. To give light. You can't give no light with just a lamp. It takes oil. They were foolish, and they took no oil with them. Now, what does oil represent in the Bible? The Holy Spirit. That's exactly right. Let's go to Zechariah. Old Testament. Zechariah. Chapter.
chapter 4. Zechariah chapter 4. Zechariah chapter 4. We're just going to start in verse 1. Here's what it says. And the angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep and said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked and behold a candlestick, or in other words, a lamp, all of gold with a bowl upon the top of it and his seven lamps thereon and seven pipes to the seven lamps which are upon the top thereof and two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl and the other upon the left side of the bowl. So I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Okay, let's pause there. What does Zechariah see? First of all, he sees two olive trees, one on the right and one on the left. And these olive trees have oil dripping out of them. What kind of oil drips out of an olive tree? Olive oil. Olive oil. And <laughs> Sorry, I'm just being obvious. Olive oil drips from the tree. It lands in a pipe, and the pipe goes into a bowl that contains all the oil. Out of the pipe, out of the bowl rather, come seven what? Come seven lamps or seven candlesticks out of it. Okay, so here we see again a lamp being represented and oil inside. Now the Bible is going to tell us exactly what that oil represents. Verse 6. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but, my, but by my, what? Spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. So the oil in the lambs represents what? The Holy Spirit. It's only when the oil and the lamps combine that we can get the light. It's only when the Holy Spirit makes the Bible active in our lives that there will be a light. So that's what we were going to study more on. But before we do, interesting, um, he tells us also, we don't need to go there, what the trees represent too. Does anybody know what the two trees represent? Close. That might be one representation. They also represent the two angels that stand in the very presence of God, one on the right and one on the left, which deliver his spirit. I have a quote in here. I'm not going to say it. Um, Christ's object lessons, the very last chapter, by the way, is where I'm going to get a lot of my stuff from. There's a lot, I've heard a lot of good sermons preached out of Christ's object lessons, so it's not nothing new information that you don't have, but it's something we can go over together. Okay, so let's go back to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. Verse 4. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. What makes them wise? because they were so smart, because they were so intellectual, right? Because they had skill more than the other five virgins. That's what made them wise, right? No. What made them wise? They were, prepared. They were prepared. What made them prepared? The Holy Spirit is what made them prepared. There's nothing we can do by ourselves, but it is only by the Holy Spirit. Who does the Holy Spirit give them to? Those who are, who ask, those who will receive, those who are humble, anyone the Holy Spirit can give to that, that miss the, meets those qualifications. 
So they were wise only because they had the Holy Spirit. That's the only way we can discern truth in the Bible is through the Holy Spirit. Verse 5. While the bridegroom tarried, how many slumbered and slept? They all. This is very interesting because we know this parable is representing the church in the last days. And God has mercy. They all slumbered and slept. Not just the foolish, but also the wise. Isn't that the state of things today? We all seem to be in this lethargy that God is trying to wake us up out of. Verse 6. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. This is what's called what? The midnight cry. That's exactly right. I want to say two things. One, that this happened in our church history. And two, that this happens in our personal history for each one of us. The midnight cry. It happened in our church history when? That's right. Right before 1844. What was going on? is everyone expected the Lord to come in 1844. They were waiting for the bridegroom. They knew the Day of Atonement was coming. Um, Daniel chapter 8 and 9 make it very clear when the Day of Atonement would happen. And they had nailed it down. And they had just enough oil in their lamps, some of them, to get them to this day. But however, when the bridegroom tarried, what happened? That's right. Many were disappointed. They ran out of oil. And you know what happened to them? Many of them left the church. This was the midnight cry. And this time of tarrying, what does it do? It separates two classes of people, the goats and the sheep. They were found that they were not the sheep because they just decided to leave. They did not have enough oil. They weren't prepared for the wait. That's exactly right. It's trying their character. And character, one uh, interesting quote, character is not uh, made, but it is revealed in a time of crisis. That's exactly right. Now, then all the, verse 7, then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. Uh-oh, we got a problem. When they all rose and trimmed their lamps, what happened? Five didn't have any oil in their lamps. Five did have oil. There was a time when all ten virgins were together. Could it be distinguished until they trimmed their lamps who was the true and who was the false? No, it could not. It wasn't until the midnight cry. The same with us. It's not till a crisis that will be able to distinguish who is the true and who is the false. Miss White in um, uh, Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings, no, it's Christ's Object Lessons, she compares the true to evergreen trees that are always green, not that wither in the winter. Some withered. So what happened when the wise trimmed their lamps? Okay, before that, what happened to their lamps? They started and they produced a what? They produced a light. They got refilled and produced light. What does light represent in the Bible? Light. Go to Exodus chapter 33. Hold this spot and go to Exodus 33. Exodus chapter 33, verse 18. Moses is talking to God here. In verse 18, it says, And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy what? Glory. 
thy light. Glory is shining light. Verse 19, and he said, I will make all my what? My goodness pass before you and proclaim the name of the Lord. The name of the Lord also represents his what? Character. And his character is his goodness. Go to chapter 34 for a second. Chapter 34 and verse 6. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, upon the children's children unto the third and fourth generation. In other words, he says, the Lord, he proclaims his name, the Lord God, merciful and gracious. What is he proclaiming? Attributes of what? His character. That's right. Moses said, I want to see your glory. God says, I'm going to pass before you, show, show you my goodness and proclaim my name. He proclaims his name, which is his character. So let's do another one. Matthew chapter 5. Verse 14 and 16. Thank you. Let's just read 14 through 16. It says, Matthew chapter 5, 14 through 16. Ye are the light of the world. A city is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they might see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. So what does this say that the light represents? You are the light. Your character shining to the world is the light. Anyone think of any other ones? I know there's a few more. I don't have them off the top of my head, but... Jesus said, I am the light of the world. That's another one. His character, his goodness, his good works was the light of the world. There's many more we could study, but through and through the Bible compares light and glory with character. And we're going to see that a lot more in the sermon as well. So let's go to Matthew chapter 25. So, so far, just to, just to see where we're at so far. So far, there's the foolish who have the truth and the word. They have no Holy Spirit work in their life. Therefore, they have no light. There's the wise which took extra Holy Spirit and the truth together combined produced light. It produced a changing character inside them that the rest of the world could see. Okay? Okay. But what do the wise say? Verse 8, and the foolish, I mean, what do the foolish say to the wise? And the foolish said unto the wise, give us of your oil, for our lamps are going out. They here recognize their need for the Holy Spirit. It wasn't until it was too late that they recognized their need for the Holy Spirit. We cannot wait to recognize our need for the Holy Spirit, friends. Do we pray in earnest? Do we seek the Bible? Do we look for it as silver? We need to be searching. Verse 9, what do the wise say? But the wise answered saying what? Not so. Why would they say not so? Any thoughts? Okay. So are they being selfish here? Okay. Any thoughts? <laughs> Absolutely. Is it possible to transfer your character to somebody else? It is not. 
So when the time comes, they say, it is impossible. Your spirituality can't be for somebody else. Give me a second here. I'm going to look for a quote. So Noah, Daniel, and Job be in the land, what? They shall not deliver son nor daughter, but who? But their own selves by their righteousness. You can't do it for your husband, your wife, your daughter, your son, your brother. You can only deliver yourself by your own righteousness. What does the Bible say? The man who sins, he shall die. And God says he will not, um, the sins of the father will not be, uh, the son will not die for the sins of the father, neither the father for the sins of the son. Every man will die for who? His own sins. That's exactly right. It is untransferable. They are not being selfish here. It's just impossible. Verse 10. Oh, verse 9, let me finish the rest of this verse. But the wise answer saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. Verse 10. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. There's no more opportunity. The door is shut. Verse 11, afterward came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said to them, Verily I say unto you, what? I do not know you. I know you not. What's that mean? Any thoughts? Why would he say that? I know you not. That's right. They didn't personally know God. Why? Who is God's representative right now? The Holy Spirit is a representative of Jesus Christ. And if we don't have the Holy Spirit in our lives, what does Jesus say? Yeah, I never knew you. I don't know you. Do we ever hear this anywhere else in Scripture? Where else does he say, I do not know you? Anywhere. Matthew 7, 21. Let's go there. Hold the spot and go to Matthew chapter 7. <clears throat> Let's read 21 through 23. Who would like to read that nice and loud for me? Okay. So these people that didn't know Jesus, they didn't have any type of spiritual experience, it says. Is that true? Tell me about what was their spiritual experience like? Okay. They did a lot of works. What kind of works? Cast out devils. Cast out devils. Prophesied. Very exciting types of things. Very... Of themselves, it was very much self. Look what I did. Look what I did. And it was also very, what's another word for exciting? Um, I, don't, I, I don't have it, but it was very exciting. You see it at some of the churches. That's all I'm going to say. As they're jumping around, it's very emotional. It's very, they had some type of experience, right? It wasn't that they didn't have an experience. It just wasn't a what? 
a true experience, a Holy Spirit-filled, a reverent type of humility experience that the truth needs. And because they did not know God, what did they not do? They didn't develop his character. That's absolutely right. And what's his character? How, how is that shown that they didn't develop his character? In verse 23, ye that work what? Iniquity. They were still sinning. If you have the character of God, he is taking sin out of your life. That's what the character is. Another version, uh, other versions say not that you that work iniquity, but you that what? Work lawlessness. What's lawlessness? It's when you break, break the law of God, his commandments. Again, his character is found, written on the law of God, on those Ten Commandments, every one of them. On love God and love your neighbor. Okay. Going back to Matthew 25. The door was shut and Jesus did not know them. Matthew 25, verse 11. Afterward came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. Now, we've got to understand this is a parable. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you what? I know you not. So there will be some who claim Christ as Lord. They will call him Lord, Lord. They will say, Open to us. But not all. You know, you know there's the verse that says, if you confess with your mouth and, mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, uh, you have salvation. A lot of people use that. Well, I've said it. Um, that's what I think. So I must be saved, right? No, that's when a deeper study of why confessing with your mouth is important. And that's why a deeper study of actually believing by faith in your heart is needed. Verse 13, watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man comes. So some were left and some remained. And they remained with God. A few um, quotes from Christ's object lessons. Christ's Object Lessons is chapter 29. Saddest of all words that ever fell on mortal ear are those words of doom. I know you not. The fellowship of the Spirit which you have slighted could alone make you one with the joyous throng at the marriage feast. In that scene, you cannot participate. Why does God not let them into the marriage feast? Yeah, they don't have the garment on. They don't have his character on. Would they be happy? No, they wouldn't. They haven't, do they have a love for heavenly things? No, they don't. What do they have a love for? This world. That's why they neglect the Holy Spirit. What does the light from the five wise virgins um, prepare the way for. As you imagine those, those five virgins with their lamps trimmed, who are they waiting for? What does their light help prepare? The way for the bridegroom. So the bridegroom knows to come and get them. If there's no light, where are the virgins? There must be light in the lamps of God's people before Jesus Christ comes back again. Through the Holy Spirit, God's word is a light, and it becomes a transforming power in the life of the receiver. Another quote, the last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world. Anyone know 
this quote, is a revelation of his character and love. Wow. That's Christ's Object Lessons, um, page 415, paragraph 5. The last rays of merciful light. That means the last message of mercy. We're going to talk about the three angels' message in a little bit. But the very last part of it is what? A revelation of his character. We need to figure out how, within the three angels' messages, is God's character being revealed to the world. Because this is the deep issue within the three angels' messages. The children of God are to manifest his glory. In their own life and character, they are to reveal what the grace of God has done for them. This is the work which the prophet Isaiah describes when he says, it is not to deal thy bread to the hungry, is it, I'm sorry, is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house, when thou seest the naked that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh, then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy reward. And that's Isaiah 58, verse 7 and 8. Again, light is a reflection of character. So how is it, question time, how is it that we shine the character of Jesus to the world? Some thoughts. I know there's a lot of thoughts, so please. How is it that we shine the light of the character of Jesus to the world? So people can see Jesus through us. What's some practical ways, just thoughts of how we can do this? Because this is our goal. This is what we need to be doing is shining Christ's character to the world. How can we do this? Aren't we silly sometimes when God says, here, do this? He whispers in our ear through the spirit, and we say, oh, wow, I'm so smart. <laughs> no, yeah, you're right. What are some of those ideas? What are some practical ways? Okay, very good. So not only, Isaiah says, not only it's a physical bread, but it's a what? A spiritual bread. What I found, you know, doing ministry even to the homeless, you know, and even in Ohio, I'm not saying we shouldn't give to the homeless. We should be at the forefront. We should be helping everyone we can. But a lot of times their deepest issue isn't necessarily a lack of bread, isn't necessarily a lack of food. You know what normally their deepest issue is? That's right. No hope lack of spirituality, lack of Jesus in their lives. But is that bread, is that food, is that help, is that an entering wedge? Yes. yes, that's the entering wedge to help solve the surface problems, right? Because humanitarianism solves a lot of the surface problems, but what the deep issue is, is the soul and the heart. That's exactly right. So we need to be shining to their soul. How can we do that? If, unless we ourselves have that light shining in us, can we give it to anyone else? What does it take to have that? Relationship. Through how? Prayer and Bible study. In one word, having our lamps filled with oil. need to go a little bit longer because it's not 1030 yet. See if I have any more good quotes. There's some good stuff in here. Yeah, just going along with that thought of hope. She says, there are many from whom hope has departed, 
bring back the sunshine to them. There's a lot of depressed people out there, isn't there? Yeah. I have someone in my family who's just so depressed. And she asked me recently, do you think God loves me? I said, oh. Does God love you? He loves you. He loves you so much. People don't realize that. I told her, he loves you as if you were his only child in the whole world. That's how much he loves you. There are many homeless people on the streets that while they might need a few things here and there, what they really need to know is people care about them. Now, we need to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves because some people will come and just try to take all your money, right? I, I have people come and say, hey, I need $10 to go get this and that. You know what I tell them? Yeah, go ahead and jump, hop in the car, and I'll take you to go get what you need. It's like, no, I just need $10. Just give me $10. My, my tire is right down the street, and it has a flat. And I was like, yeah, hop in. He's like, I don't know you. I was like, I don't know you either. Just jump in. Now, I don't, I don't say, for if you're a woman, don't do that. But if you're someone who can take care of themselves, you know, you can go get the tire for them and bring them back. He didn't want that. There was a reason. Because there was no tire. He didn't, you know. But if someone has a need, it might take some self-sacrifice to fill that need. If he would have wanted something, you know what I had to do? If there was something he needed that I saw, I had to get out that pocketbook, right? And sacrifice a little bit. Speak to them words of cheer. Pray for them. There are those who need the bread of life. Read to them from the word of God. You know there's a lack of literacy in the word of God? People just believe whatever they think these days. Upon many is a soul sickness which no earthly balm can reach, nor physician heal. Pray for these souls. Bring them to Jesus. Tell them that there is a balm in Gilead and a physician there. Christ does not bid his followers strive to shine. He says, let your light shine. If you have received the grace of God, the light is in you. Remove the obstructions and the glory will be revealed. The light will shine forth to penetrate and dispel the darkness. So how do we overcome darkness? We fight the darkness with all we have, right? Is that what you do? How do you overcome darkness? It's as simple as turning on the light, the light of Jesus Christ. Jesus can overcome the darkness. You just got to let Jesus shine. That's Christ's Object Lessons 420, paragraph 1. The revelation of his own glory in the form on humanity will bring heaven so near to men that the beauty adorning the inner temple will be seen in every soul in whom the Savior dwells. In closing, friends, we know Jesus Christ is coming soon. We know we need our lamps. We know we need our lamps trimmed and burning. We need a character. We have character development that we need to go on right now. We cannot wait till it's too late. If we wait till it's too late, what will happen? We will be lost. We will be the foolish virgins. If we want to be wise, wise virgins, we need the Holy Spirit now. We need to be searching him day by day and letting our light shine 